Poverty, desperation and frustration are a potent mix, and a deep-seated anger has flared up. It's directed at foreigners. The message is clear. Get out of our country. It all started in Alexandra. On Sunday 10th of May, violence broke out at the Beirut hostel. Screams and gunshots resounded through the night. Angry mobs had attacked the foreigners living in their midst. A soldier came to me. They hit me. And what did they say to you when they hit you? I am a foreigner. I heard shouting. Foreigners, foreigners, we don't want foreigners. Come, let's go. Let's beat foreigners. You see, with the gun, gunshots. You see, so ish. You know, I thought maybe I'm going to die. Throughout the day, the foreigners, mainly from Zimbabwe, fled to the safety of Alexandra police station. A chilling picture began to emerge. The residents there uh, went from shack to shack, looking from people outside the country and uh, fighting them out of uh, their uh, shacks. Over the next few days, the police beefed up security to bring the situation under control. While they managed to disperse large crowds, smaller gangs roamed the township, preying on the vulnerable. We found groups of frightened people on the road, waiting for the police to take them to safety. They tell me to get out. Why? You can see I'm, I'm only in pyjamas. What, why? They say I must go back. To where? I, I'm from Zimbabwe. I got ID. I got everything from here. The next day, we found Leon here at the Alexandra police station. He had spent the night waiting for an escort to collect his belongings. He is one of the hundreds of people needing attention. The police are overwhelmed and make it clear they can't help everyone. I've been sitting here for the whole day from 8 o'clock. The police didn't want to help me. The night before, a group of men had dragged him out of bed and beaten him with a shambok. <laughs> I was not expecting anything. I was very angry instead of being terrified. I thought oh, I must fight. And then uh, I thought because there were too many, otherwise they'd kill me. He came home to collect a few essential things, despite knowing that some of his neighbors were behind the attack. I know they came next door. Uh, the people are saying, I know those guys. Because it was dark, they were hiding. The, the, those whom I know, they were hiding. And they sent the, those who I don't know to come and break. But they were there. After 30 years in Alexandra, he locked up his shack and left with a change of clothes, a toothbrush and some washing powder. He's determined to return. I'm not going to go back to my home country. <laughs> I've worked here for so long. All my strength is finished in this country. So now I'm going back to my shack. They like it or not. But he may not be able to. Most of the shacks belonging to foreigners have been taken over by locals. After they were ransacked, new locks have been fitted on the doors and messages warn the previous owners to stay away. Groups of men guard against any attempts. I don't think it's going to be easy for them to come back 
to take back their properties because they are already owned by other people. So if I own my next, the, the shack that it was that used to be my for my next door neighbor, yeah, now I can even call my brother or my friend, my homeboy, come and look for a job in Joburg. It's it's nice now. Yeah, I've got the property, the new property that I own. Yeah. Shacks were not the only thing people stole. Fridges, TVs, work tools and hidden stashes of money were also looted. Everything of no value was simply burnt or thrown into the street to be picked over by children. All those who are here illegally, they must go back home. Yeah. Yeah, not only the Zimbabwean and Nigerians, those who are from DRC, Congo DRC. Even though Mdu likes to watch Nigerian movies, he's fed up with foreigners. Well, on the other side, I can say South Africans, they are good. On the other side, I can say they are not good, OK, if it comes. He thinks that they are taking away what is rightfully his. So when the attack started, he joined in. From the RDP. People from outside the country, they are owning houses. If you go to River Park, you, you, River Park, you find the Zimba, Mozambican, Zimbabwean, Nigerian, they are owning houses. But if I take my sea form now and go to the Department of Housing in Jobek, they will say subsidy approved. Who's in my house? Tell me now. Who's in my house? It's a foreigner. And a South African, a citizen of this country, who stays in a shit place like this. Why? The violence in Alexandra left over 600 people displaced. 60 people were injured and six killed. Three were South African. The poor have elected a government. Instead of turning to a government and say, you promised us jobs, you promised us houses, they turn to foreigners and say, foreigners are taking our jobs. It is a wrong approach really to turn uh, on foreigners because it is a war of the poor on the poor. Mr. Dlamini lost his son when a mob mistook him for a foreigner. Why my child? He's not a foreigner. He's a child of South Africa. He was born here and he grew up here. He was born here and grew up here and he's working here and he's living here. Is it the end of the world or what? I don't know. To me, it seems as if it's the end of the world just because they've taken me, my, my beloved ones. Charles was killed across the road from his father. His brother Maxwell tried to save him. I hear them screaming to Charles, beating their, beating Shark's heart with uh, axes, uh, no gears. Sticks. Uh, I, I scream and say, he's not a, a outsider, he's not a foreigner, he's a South African. His name is Tabo, his name is Lamy. He was bleeding. Here, the, the blood, it was like a, a, a broken tap. A day after he was released from hospital, Charles died. Even talking, it, it, it was... It, Four days after the attacks began, the Minister of Home Affairs announced a plan to end the violence and restore peace. And they are optimistic that by end of the week, they will be able to stem this uh, tide of violence in Alex with the help of the police. The very same day, fighting broke out in Deep Sloot. It seemed that the violence was gathering momentum and ferocity. Five people were shot, 
the mob struck at night. A place to stay. We actually, we are living like tenants in the country of our birth. We pay rent to these people because they are the ones who own like, the RDP houses. There is no place anymore. Go to jobs, we are under these people. Anything, they are controlling now. So we need the president to know that we are not criminals, we are the citizens of South Africa. So we need to tell the government that if they don't know how to do the job, we will we'll do it ourselves. We will kill. His anger reveals a deep sense of exclusion. The mob's fury may be directed at foreigners, but it points to greater underlying issues than xenophobia. We have not seen the kind of unity, say the ANC president and the state president, together holding hands sending out a clear message that is united. Societies, when there are problems, look for leadership. The question is, where is the leadership? And if the political party that is ruling this country, which is the ANC, does not seem to be in control of the situation, the question is, who is going to have moral authority in order to calm down the situation? Analysts say, one only needs to look at the living conditions of people in townships to understand what ignited the attacks. A lack of services, grinding poverty and frustrated dreams have pushed poor South Africans to the limit. I suspect that the spark in this case was in part to do with the pinch that poor communities are starting to feel due to rising economic pressures, food prices again and fuel prices again and that they are lashing out at who they see as responsible for that. Foreigners have been blamed for many of the country's ills. The government's current refugee policies have pitted poor South Africans against the 10 million or so legal and illegal immigrants in the country. We have a situation where the government is passing the bug of the failure of its population, of its policies, is passing that back to the poor people of South Africa and then preaching to them to love their neighbor. Destruction of the economy and repression in Zimbabwe is forcing millions to flee to South Africa. The government calls them economic migrants, not refugees. It means they can't get a permit to live and work here so they stay illegally. In reality, they don't exist. And if they don't exist, they don't have rights. So the police can harass them. Anyone, the criminals can kill them. Anything can happen, which is what we are happening. So we are actually allowing the anarchy that Mugabe has created in Zimbabwe to be exported into South Africa and to continue that anarchy. Even recognized asylum seekers struggle. Few employers recognize the documents they are issued by Home Affairs. Without jobs, both legal and illegal immigrants are forced to eke out a living in the informal sector, alongside South Africa's poorest, who view them as competition. Poor people will always look for solutions to their problems. Now, in this case, poor people don't have jobs, they don't have houses. They look around, they see an influx of, a greater influx of foreigners coming to their communities. Now, they tend to use foreigners as the scapegoat. A depressed social climate is fertile ground for rumors and resentment towards foreigners has grown. Here very clearly that the poor of this country are coming to the place where they actually are not going to care about the niceties of whose property is what. Um, to have to scratch in dustbins for your food, to have to continue worrying about how you're going to educate your children and clothe yourself as winter approaches to wonder how you're going to keep yourself warm and if there is a job just doing any menial kind of task to sometimes actually wonder whether you're a human being 
and whether you will ever, ever have anything but the fare of the poor to eat, ultimately must come to the place where you will, you've got nothing to lose. As the attacks spread across Gauteng, it seems the violence is spiralling out of control. Authorities have been caught completely off guard. No one anticipated that the lawlessness would spread with such intensity. Police lack information as to where the violence will flare up, giving the mobs the advantage. They can strike before the authorities get there. To date, there have been at least 23 deaths, hundreds injured and thousands displaced. Police have arrested 257 people. Spaza shops and businesses have been looted and property worth thousands of rand destroyed. But the fact that this thing is moving from one township to the other and spreads like felt fire, the way we have seen it, suggests to me that there is an element of organization behind this. The question is, where is our intelligence in all this? Because our intelligence is supposed to be a step ahead of whoever seeks to dis destabilize society. The government was warned of xenophobia brewing amongst poor communities in the Cape over 10 years ago. They failed to act then and it spread. Somali traders were the first targets of xenophobic attacks. Nearly 500 had been shot or burnt alive. Authorities claimed that xenophobia wasn't a problem in South African society. I think also to some extent where they've been where there's been violence targeted at immigrant communities, the response has been the incorrect one. Um, the response has been one to say that South Africans should embrace foreigners, that, um, that we should hold meetings and we should have interventions and we should have get-togethers and community leaders should talk about the problem. It is, in large part, a law enforcement problem. It's come back to haunt them. The eruption of xenophobia now shows the true extent of people's resentment. Police have been helpless to prevent the attacks, only arriving after the worst is over. It's just a little bit like, in, like Zimbabwe. Because if your belongings are taken, how do you live? A person must have a, a good life. So when you are entitled to a, to a good life, somebody will come and say, ah, oh, no, uh, you find those things here in South Africa, so we have to take all your belongings so that you can go back to Zimbabwe. When we went back to their shack, youths drunk on power and alcohol threatened to kill us. I was just running away from Zimbabwe, thinking that the law will protect me in South Africa. The law itself doesn't protect us as foreigners. If you are going to a police station now, they will tell you that uh, we cannot go and search those, those properties. So we are encouraging the police to take an action. But you can find out that they couldn't take a, an action. Our shakes were being demolished. Where well, they are just... Where are they just... They are just there. The two men are now living in the bush. It's the second time they have lost everything. They left Zimbabwe after their homes and businesses were destroyed in Mugabe's notorious clean out the filth campaign. It seems the same is happening again. We can't turn around and blame the poor people of South Africa who have to carry the burden of Mugabe destroying the economy of Zimbabwe. It's the poor people in Alexander Township who are having to bear this burden. It's not the government, it's not the guys sitting in union buildings, it's not the Minister of Home Affairs. But now that the government is faced with thousands of Zimbabweans displaced within their cities, they are faced with a humanitarian crisis. 
we need an emergency arrangement to house uh, Zimbabweans. We can't dig our, our heads in the sand and pretend that Zimbabweans are not entering the country en mass. They are entering. Now, what is it that our government is doing, Home Affairs specifically, to really attend to the Zimbabwean question as a specific case? One peace in our community, one sanity in our community. We are going to defend our democracy. The people in Deep Sloot want to restore peace to their neighborhood, horrified by the destruction that has taken place. They want to clear the streets of barricades and send a message to those involved. We are sending a message to the criminals because we believe that uh, this activity that is happening in our own community, uh, it's criminals who are disguising under the um, who are disguising under the, uh, the the issues of xenophobia and illegal immigrants. This is another typical example of this criminal activity because they just want they are looking for something much more important which they can take for for their own benefit. They've managed to recover some of the stolen goods and are working with the police to identify perpetrators. Most people here don't support the violence, but they do share the belief that there's a problem of too many illegal immigrants. They want the government to deal with it. Basically, the community is saying that the authorities deal with this thing. This is not the way of doing things um, uh, where people are taking law into their own hands. But as the townships continue to burn, labelling the events as criminal exonerates the government of responsibility. But it may be a short-sighted tactic. If we do not have leadership, we are going to run into a situation where hooligans and criminals are going to take over the space that exists in society. One thing we cannot do is stand aside and watch. All South Africans must hear. It's beginning with foreigners, it's not going to end there.